Good morning. How are you? Hope you had a good week. I heard a few goods. Hope you had a good week. And if not, isn't it awesome to get together and worship together? You cannot replicate that at home, I tell you, no matter how good your CD player is. You just cannot replicate when people come together and just worship with all their hearts, all their soul. And so that's why we come together, because it's a recharge for the, for the week. No matter what the week throws at us, we still got our worship, right? Um, so if you're here for the first time, you're probably wondering, who is she? Because there's typically a much taller person here. Um, and so anyway, if you're here and are wondering where Pastor Dave is, um, a few weeks ago he started a sabbatical. He's working on his uh, doctorate, and he's supposedly writing a bunch of stuff. And so we wish him the best, and so um, he's asked me to cover some of his responsibilities for the next few weeks. Um, he'll be back in April, and so don't fret, he will be back but we are glad that you're here with us today. And last week we started our, our series called In the Game. In the Game. And last week we talked about how church is meant to be this, this uh, place where we come together and we love each other. And oh my goodness, we actually serve each other, right? And it's a place where we learn how, how to put others before us. And so... That's a great foundation for, for a bigger calling that, that God has for us as a church. As we learn to love each other, serve each other, we're going to learn how to love those who may not be as lovable as we think, right? So um, the song... You are good. I was thinking as we were singing, by the way, one of my favorite songs. Thank you for choosing that. I know you, you had no idea, but God made you choose that because it's just one of my favorite songs. But it says, you are good, you are good, and most of us know that. But the person we're talking about today, he actually thought God was too good. Can you believe that? You're too good, God. Too good. And so we're going to find out a little more about that. So today we're on our second, uh, second part of our series, In the Game, A Cry for Help. We're going to find out what that means. Last year, there was another shooting, and unfortunately that's become quite common in our culture, hasn't it? There was a shooting in western Kentucky where a 15-year-old student walked into his school, kill, killed two students, and injured about 18 others. Um, there was, do you know how they, I don't know why the, the media does that, but immediately they put a mic in front of the parents. I'm like, give them time, but they were interviewing one of the mothers of, of one of the students that was killed. And the mom said, this, I, f I found this really interesting, the mom said, I will pray for the shooter, but I'm not sure I will ever be able to face him. I'm not even sure I can go to court and see him. I want him to pay for everything he's done, she said. And then she paused and said, I also want to pray for him. Because I know he's probably having a hard time, but he took our baby. He took my baby. The words of this suffering mother perfectly summarize the dilemma that most Christians, if not all Christians, have to face at some point in their lives. Someone has stolen from us or taken someone or something precious. At time Someone has injured us or abused us or, or neglected us or, or ill-treated us or, or, or ridiculed us. And then the words of Jesus echo in the back of our minds. 
In Matthew 4, 5.44, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now these are lovely words to read, aren't they? But they're extremely difficult to follow in real life. I remember a long time ago, I had a terrible boss. I mean, this person was conniving and manipulative, and, and it was a, a backstabber, really. And so anything that I said, he would twist it and insert it in some, some sort of religious shaming thing because he would say, you should know better because you're a Christian. Just the, the mention of his name would make me furious. And so... The, ec- the words of Matthew 5.44 would echo in my ears. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. So I would be like, okay, God, I'm not going to wish him harm. I'm not praying for him. I just really pray that he gets a really big promotion somewhere far, far away from me. And you know, as I look back at that experience, I think never once did it occur to me to pray for him. I was so caught up in my own world, in my own career, in my own uh, advancement, my own plans, that it just never occurred to me that maybe, just maybe, God sent me to that company, that job, at that specific time under that terrible boss so that I could witness to him. Loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us, it's perhaps one of the hardest callings God has given to us. Someone who really, really struggled with this was the prophet Jonah. You know, his story has been sanitized and diluted so that we could tell the story to children, but the reality of the story is a lot darker than we make it out to be. His story starts in 2 Kings. And we find him in chapter 14 having the time of his life. He was a very popular prophet. His one job was to give good news to the people. And who doesn't like to bring good news to people? Do you remember the movie, the VeggieTales uh, Jonah movie? What's the word? People just love it, loved it when Jonah was around. He brought good news. And then one day, God interrupts this bed of roses that he was walking on. And he said, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. And then I need you to preach a message that I have for them. What? Go where? Um, I have no intentions of going to Nineveh. Those are evil, evil people. To Jonah, Nineveh was uh, perhaps, what's the, what's the word? Maybe the people that Satan himself consulted when, they needed an evil, when he needed an evil plan. That's how evil Nineveh was. They were notorious enemies of the people of Israel. They had conquered about 46 of Judah's cities, and not only did they conquer, they loved to boast about it. Assyria had a lot going on for them, and Nineveh being the biggest city in the biggest country at the time, and the, and the most powerful country at the time, they had a lot going for them. They were very, very powerful. It was no match for the Israelites. You know, they had good things going. They had inventions that we still use today, like keys and locks and timekeeping uh, systems and, and paved roads and plumbing and uh, flushing toilets and even the idea of government being divided in, into territories. All of that came out of Assyria. But they were also wicked, evil, callous, lawless, the wild, wild west of the East. The military rulers of Assyria were as cruel as it could get, and they took pride in it. 
Their tactics were well known all over the world and they were terrifying. Some of the things they were known for was slaying their enemies and they loved spreading the, the skins of their enemies all around. They loved chopping body parts and, and, and then they would even put live people inside the walls of the cities just so that they could show how powerful they were. Oh, I could go on and on and on. But anything I tell you could not come close to describing how evil the people of Assyria were. They were truly diabolical. And so this was no children's fable. And Jonah knew it. He's like, I do not want anything to do with this people. If anything, I wish they would just burn to death. That would be something I would go and watch. I wonder what would we do? What would we say if God came to us and gave us the task to preach to some of the darkest places on earth? So we all know what happened. Jonah got on a ship and the ship, there was a storm and the ship got crazy. And then the people that were in the ship were, with him realized, oh, he's the reason why this storm is happening. You know that when non-believers are looking at you and going, oh, you messed up big time. You know you messed up big time. <laughs> so they took him and threw him out of the ship and poof, the storm is gone. And then a big fish came under strict orders to take this runaway prophet straight to the shores of Nineveh. What I find interesting is that when he is in the belly of this big fish, he prays one of the most beautiful prayers that you will ever read in the Bible. It's found in Jonah chapter 2, and it says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Verse 5 through 7 says, The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So here we have Jonah, first of all, asking for a second chance. He realized he messed up. It's a beautiful picture that he paints, that he felt so separated from God. And he's so grateful that God has given him a second chance and that now he gets to do whatever God asked him to do. For real, God, this time, I'm going to do it. Well, he had no choice because the, way, the fish literally vomited him on the shores of Nineveh. And so really, that took away the choice he had. So he's standing there on the shores of Nineveh, and as soon as he lands, God called him one more time. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So, Jonah does what God asked him to do. He takes, oh, sorry, there we go. So Jonah takes three days, walks all over the city, and preaches what God had told him to do. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now that's all the Bible tells us. I, it, could have, it could have been more than that, or maybe that was his favorite part of the message, and that's why it's in the Bible. But the point is that he went all over Nineveh, Telling them destruction is coming, you need to repent, destruction is coming, you need to repent, and it worked. It worked. 
It says, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Can you just picture this? I mean, he is walking around the city telling them destruction is coming, repent, and it works. Do you know any evangelist who has ever had such success? I mean, I don't know any pastors who walks into a church and next thing you know, there are thousands of baptisms. There, it's just, it's unheard of. So this should be the part where we read, and Jonah sobbed with gratitude because God used him in such a mighty way. He just couldn't believe the power of God in his life. And not only that, but now they have nicer neighbors. The end. Unfortunately, that is not the end of the story. Instead, we read this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. He was angry because God was too good. God was too merciful. Oh, and he takes it even further. Oh, and he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. And therefore now... Oh, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He was a bit dramatic, wasn't he? <laughs> Have you ever heard anyone complain that God is too good? I mean, I've heard a lot of complaints about God. Never that he is too good and too merciful. So Jonah is basically saying, God, this is exactly why I didn't want to come here. I just knew it. I knew that's what's going to happen. You are going to change your mind. I was really looking forward to the fire and, and brimstone show, but no. You have to forgive them. And you have to be merciful. Oh, and now, and now they get to turn their lives around and start all over again. Really, God? Really? So God is so patient with Jonah. And he says, is it right for you to be angry? I mean, just the, the grace found in this few words. Jonah, come on. Really? Jonah doesn't answer God. He storms out of the city, finds a place up away from Nineveh because he was sure at some point there was fire coming from heaven and he didn't want to miss the show. So the lessons keep on coming for Jonah. So God is... Okay, let me change my strategy here. So he allows a plant to grow so that while Jonah is waiting for fire, his head wouldn't burn up. Get the logic here? So he's waiting for this to happen, for destruction to come his way. And when he realizes the plant is growing, this is the first time, and by the way, the last time we see him perk up in the entire story. The first time and the last time we see Jonah happy in the entire story is when a plant grows to give shade over his head. Do you remember what happened a few moments before? Thousands of people saying they love God now? They don't want to do evil anymore? This is what brings him joy and happiness, a plant for him. 
Oh, but calamity strikes again. A worm came and ate his plant. <laughs> okay, now I'm sad again. Once again, God is so patient with him. And he said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, it is. You can almost hear him stumping, right? It is. I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Oh, my Lord. He really likes the drama arts. He so hated the people of Nineveh that he would much rather lose his own salvation than to see them come to know Christ. He would much rather lose his own life than to see those people accept God and worship Him. I read the story of Joyce Meyer. She's a popular uh, author and a popular speaker. Anyone recognizes the name? And she was telling the story of, she's told a few times, the story of her own life. And as a child, her own father sexually, physically, and mentally abused her from the age of nine until she was able to leave the house at the age of 18. She said the things he did to her were so unspeakable that she has never and probably will never be able to tell her full story. As a young girl, she gave her life to Christ, uh, but she found it very difficult to understand what she was learning at church and, and reconcile that with what was happening at home. And so after she left home, she married someone who was a serial cheater, and so that marriage ended before it started. And her journey continued, and then she finally met a man who was kind and loving, and they married and then God began to work on both of them until they decided to give their lives to Christ together. And then they um, started a ministry together on the radio and television in the city of Chicago. And God was working behind the scenes, helping her forgive, forgive, forgive. It took many years. But she finally came to the point where she was able to tell the words to her own father, I forgive you. To which her father replied, Joyce, I'm so sorry that you feel I hurt you. I don't see anything wrong with what I did. So as her father got older and frail, God kept asking her and working on her heart and the heart of her husband, take care of your father. Take care of your father. And she was like, no, thank you. Take care of your father. I can't do that, God. I'm sorry. I forgave him. That's as far as I go. Take care of your father. Finally, both her husband and her were so convicted about this that they unwillingly started to take care of her father. Every food purchased, they bought a house for him near their house. Every kind word, every time they took him to the doctors, every touch of compassion began to chip away at the hard rock surface of this man. Until one day, with tears in his eyes, he finally admitted to have been wrong and asked for forgiveness. Not just of Joy's, but of her husband for everything he had put her through. But her story didn't stop there. She decided to share the gospel with her father. And said, Dad, do you... Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And he said, yes. And then a few days before he died, she had the immense privilege of taking her father to the waters of baptism. 
A church that is fully in the game is a church that not only loves and serves each other, it's a church with a heart for the lost. And unfortunately, Jonah never got it. A hundred years after Jonah's time, the prophet Nahum wrote about the condition in the city of Nineveh. Nahum chapter 3, verse 1 through 4 says, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry and flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. Can you imagine living there? All because of the wanton lust of a prostitute alluring, the mistress of sorceries, who enslaved nations by her prostitutions and peoples by her witchcraft. So sadly, just a few generations after Jonah, we see Nineveh relapsing into the same place where they were before Jonah came. And there are historical accounts that say that a revival, a spiritual revival, did happen in the city of Nineveh. So for a time, they were in the right track. And just a few generations later, we read this. I often wonder, what would have happened if Jonah had taken his responsibility more seriously? What would have happened if Jonah decided to stay a little longer? Maybe pray a little harder or, or maybe even disciple a few spiritual leaders that would take this city to the next level. What would have happened if Jonah had seen the people of Nineveh through the eyes of God? I feel like sometimes we as, as church are like the picture on the screen. We have the gospel. We have the good news. Sometimes it's hard for us to share it, and the world is begging for just a glimpse of hope. And instead of sharing the hope, we keep it to ourselves. There was another prophet who was also called to preach to stubborn people and rebellious people, he was the prophet Ezekiel, and he was sent to his own people, the Israelites, because the Israelites had become so rebellious against God that they had forgotten everything they had learned. They had forgotten everything God had taught them. And so God was really fed up with their behavior. And the plan was to destroy um, pretty much anybody who didn't have the mark on their foreheads. And so what was the mark on their foreheads? Ezekiel 9.4 tells us, And the Lord said to him, he was talking to an angel, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. Those who sigh and those who groan over the abominations. So God wanted to start all over again, but this time he wanted those who were truly sorrowful and those who were really uh, sorrow and, and, and sadness and, and really regretting the condition of the, the sin that was around them. Those who mourned and those who cried and those who prayed for those who were lost around them. That, those people, God wanted to start all over again with. And you know, God is still looking for people who have a heart for the lost. Those who see the world in a desperate need of a God a desperate need of a God who is long-suffering, who is merciful, who is full of love, 
who is full of mercy and grace. And he is calling us to repent. And he is calling us to a relationship with him. So I ask today, who is your Nineveh? Who is your Nineveh? Have you prayed for your Nineveh today? May God help us see the world through his eyes. May we, may we see not, not the sin around us, but the sinner who is in desperate need of God, who is in desperate need to hear the words of hope that God is merciful, that God is truly long-suffering and patient, and he is waiting for each of us to turn around and see him as he fully is. May we, may we be the carriers of that hope. May we be the light in a dark place. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you because you are too good. You are so good, Lord. Our sin does not catch you by surprise, Father. And yet you call us to come to you. You call us to accept the invitation and then you invite us to share that good news with the world around us. I praise you because you are holy, because you are long-suffering, and you wait and wait and wait. Father, let us not sit with the good news in our hands anymore, but to take action, to pray for those around us, to go where you need us to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.